The following statements are taken from official documents, newspapers, and articles widely read during their day. Now, these are from uh, several decades uh, ago. Now, we uh, to read it today, we, it may sound funny, but back then, they were quite authoritative. Flight by machines heavier than air is unpractical and insignificant. It is utterly impossible. Who said that? An astronomer, believe it or not, in 1902. The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad, meaning it's going to pass away. Hmm. Who said that? The president of the Michigan Savings Bank in 1903. Then someone said the rocket will never be able to leave the Earth's atmosphere. New York Times article, 1920. People will soon get tired of staring at the plywood box every night, <laughs> referring to the television, by a film producer, of all people, way back in 1946. Remote shopping, while entirely feasible, will flop. Why? Because women like to get out of the house, like to handle merchandise, and most of all, they like to be able to change their minds. Times Magazine. Time Magazine, uh, an article entitled The Futurist, looking toward 82,000. Hmm, 19, written in 1966. There's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Proudly proclaimed Ken Olson, founder of the computer company Digital Equipment Corporation. Hmm, no wonder we don't hear about that today in 1977. Then the last one, cellular phones will absolutely not replace local wire systems. Why? Even if you project it beyond our lifetimes, he said, it won't be cheap enough. Motorola, director of research, 1981. You see, just because someone said something will happen, no matter how authoritative, um, we know that they're not always true, okay? And they're not always reliable, especially when we're talking about something that will happen in the future. I'm sure, you know, the news today, the articles we read today, if we were to read them a hundred years from now, we would say, wow, that's really funny, okay? And and it's not, re it, it doesn't really happen that way. So we will doubt when authorities tell us things today and we say, hmm, I don't really believe in that. But what if it's God? What if God is telling us something that will happen in the future? Would we believe him? If it were God telling us something, do we doubt him? You say, no, I never doubt God, okay? What he says, I always believe. But is that so? How often we also doubt God, right? We say, hmm, is this what the Bible is saying? Is this true? Is, is God really like that? And sometimes we also doubt God. Or in our life experience, we say, how come it's like this? How come this happened? How come? And then we have so much doubt coming into our hearts and minds. So what do we do when we have doubts? What should we do when doubts come into our lives? Today, we're going to look at the story, the story of Zechariah, and how he dealt with the issue of faith and doubt. Now, this story is at the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Remember, Luke said that he wrote this so that his friend Theophilus and by, you know, all of us, by extension, all of us who read the gospel that he has written will come to be certain of the truth that we have been told. Okay, so that's what he wanted to do. So in choosing this story about Zechariah at the very beginning of the gospel, you know, it's a long gospel that he's going to write. I think it's intentionally chosen because what Zechariah had to face was something that's too good to be true. And the rest of the gospel, actually, if you think about it, the, the Son of God coming, what He does for us, our sins will be forgiven, He died for us, all these things, actually, are too good to be true. And so, do we believe, would we believe in the rest of the gospel, just like would Zechariah believe in God when he was told something that's too good to be true? And so, I think this is a, a critical story, an important story at the beginning, because it shows us, just like Zechariah, we need to deal with our faith and our doubts. So we're going to look at Zechariah and what he did. And we're going to look at his doubts and also his faith. Yes, actually he had both. He had faith and doubt in his life. And we're going to look at this story and let's see exactly what happened to him and what we can learn from him. Luke chapter 1, verse 5 to 25. Let's start with verse 5. 
When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children, however, however, because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, and his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He will never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will call cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Now, let's stop here for a moment. Now, if you were, if you were Zechariah, I don't know how much you heard that, uh, that announcement. I think Zechariah probably stopped at the first phrase when the angel said, your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son. And then the rest he did not hear. Why do I say that? Because of his response. Okay, let's listen to his response. Verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in eight, in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you did not believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he could not speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. She has ta- he has taken away my disgrace of having no children. This is a very interesting choice for the opening story. And again, I, I believe Luke was setting the stage for the rest of the gospel. Um, so why, why this? Okay, so I think it's because he wants us to decide, is Luke telling the truth? Is this too good to be true? Let's look at Zechariah and look at his doubts and also his faith. Yes, he has both. And let's first look at his faith. Why, why would we say that Zechariah was faithful? Okay, he was full of faith. First, I think we say he is faithful because he waited obediently. Zechariah waited obediently. From verse 5 to 7, we realize that both Zechariah and Elizabeth were of priestly lineage. They were both godly. They were both obedient to God. The only problem was that Elizabeth was barren. Now, Luke, being a doctor, he noted that it was because Elizabeth was barren. Hmm, now if you think about that, okay, if that's a problem, what could be a good solution? Hmm, if you were Zechariah, I'm sure you know the Old Testament very well. You're a priest after all. And he must have read stories about Abraham, stories about Lot. When their wives could not give birth, what did they do? Hmm, they got concubines. They got a surrogate mother to, to bear their children. Hey, if there are pre- uh, precedents like that, so why not Zechariah? Or Zechariah must have thought, hey, maybe I could divorce uh, Elizabeth, you know, get me a new wife, a wife that could bear children. And we know old people, old men also can, 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 you know, father children in their old age. So it's not impossible. So Zechariah could have taken things into his own hands. That's what I'm trying to say. And yet he remained faithful. He remained obedient to the Lord. He did not take matter into his own hands. How often we do that? When God doesn't answer me, well, 
If he doesn't want to give it to me, then I'll get it myself. If God doesn't want to answer my prayer, then I'll make my own answer. How often we take matters into our hands. Now, time and time again, we see in the Bible when Bible characters do that, especially, you know, we saw, we just talked about Abraham and Jacob. When they did that, what happened? Even up to today, the Jews are still paying the price for their disobedience. Zechariah remained obedient to the Lord. And that is faith because faith keeps obeying even when nothing is happening. Faith keeps obeying even when nothing is happening. Zechariah continued to obey. He did not take matters into his own hand. How about us? I think today it's even more complicated, don't you think? Because of all the medical advances, because of what we can do with all the scientific advancement, with all the you know machines and computers and all these things, it's so easy for us to rely on other things. It's so easy for us to put our trust in other things. Now, I'm not, I'm not here doing a blanket statement or, or giving a general principle of how to deal with uh, all these uh, medical advances, okay? And medical intervention, how far is too far? I think this is a very sensitive and very personal issue. We need to seek the Holy Spirit's help and guidance for each one of us, okay? How far is too far? But my point is this, we should not take matters into our own hands, especially when it involves disobedience. When we know what we're doing is not exactly, it's not exactly legal, but we know it's not right. We should not do that. Zechariah remained faithful. He remained obedient, even though nothing was happening. We also see Zechariah was faithful because he waited actively. While he was waiting, okay, he's getting old. He and Elizabeth were getting old. What was he doing? Notice, during all this time, Zechariah was still serving the Lord. He was a priest and he was a faithful priest. And he was doing his duties like he is supposed to. Many people, when they don't get their answers from God, okay, when they pray and pray and God doesn't answer them, what do they do? Hmm. Sometimes we pout and say, huh, if God doesn't answer me, then I'm not going to answer him. I'm not going to pray. If God doesn't want to give it to me, then I won't give him anything. I won't serve. And, you know, if God doesn't want to talk to me, then I won't talk to him. And we pout and we get angry at God and we don't want to do anything. What about Zechariah? He did not get an answer from the Lord also. But what did he do? He continued to serve faithfully. He continued to serve God. When the Israelites were taken as captive, they were exiled to Babylon. They were in a place they didn't want to be. I'm sure it was, you know, not ideal and there are a lot of sufferings. They were slaves and it was very difficult. What did God tell them to do? What did God want them to do? Jeremiah 29, verse 5 to 6. God told them, this is what God said to them, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. What was God saying to them? God is saying to them, be active. Even though, yes, you don't like the circumstance. Yes, you don't like to be there. Yes, God's answer is not forthcoming. What do you need to do? You still keep faithful. You still be actively serving the Lord because that is faith. Faith keeps serving even when no answer is forthcoming. We keep serving. We keep doing what God wants us to do. We do not sit around and, and you know, uh, pout and mope around, have a gloomy face and get angry at God, sulking and disobeying Him. Rather, we continue to be active. We continue to seek after Him. And the third thing we see that Zechariah was faithful because he waited patiently. When the angel told Zechariah that God has heard their prayers, what does it mean? It means that even at that age, even though they're past the age of childbearing, Zechariah and Elizabeth were still praying. They were still waiting patiently. Now, I don't know how they believe God would answer their prayers. I don't know that, but I do know that they continue to pray. They did not give up their faith. Their faith kept them going. Faith keeps holding on even when I don't like what's going on. Even though, you know, what's happening was not ideal. You know, God, we don't have a child. We don't have a child. And all these things were happening. Zechariah continued to wait 
patiently and he waited faithfully. You know, today, if you think about it, it's been a while also since our Lord promised us that he will come back again. It's more than 2,000 years now since he promised that he will come again. What do we do? Do we say, well, nothing's happening. Okay, so I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm not going to wait anymore. We still need to wait faithfully. We still need to wait patiently. And we wait as long as it takes because we believe him to be who he says he is. And we believe him when he says he's going to come again. Revelation 22, verse 20. He who testifies to this thing says, yes, I am coming soon. That's what he said. Yes, I am coming soon. Do we believe him? Do we believe that in the twinkling of an eye, like in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye, in, in, in a moment, just like that, he will come, he will be here. Because of that fact, because we know that at any moment, Christ can come and he will be here again, just like he said. Therefore, we should live as if Christ will show up today. We live, let me say it again, we live as if Christ will show up today. That's how we live. We need to continue to have faith, to serve faithfully, to wait faithfully, and to be patient in waiting for his coming. So we see Zechariah, he was faithful. You know, many things show us that he was faithful. But then Zechariah became doubtful. Okay, what happened? How come he, you know, he, he had so much faith? How come he was filled with doubt? Well, let's look at several things, okay? Be before we point the fingers at him, remember, maybe if we were in his shoes, we might do the same. Why? Well, how come Zechariah became doubtful? First of all, it was physically impossible. Physically, it was not possible for them to have children anymore. Uh, both Zechariah and Elizabeth were very old. Very, not just old, but very old. And they figured out that the problem was with Elizabeth. He was barren. And like what many people say today, when the factory is closed, it's closed. There's nothing you can do about it. Physically, it was impossible. Historically, it was improbable. Why do I say that? Well, because it's been 400 years since the last time God spoke to his people. 400 years. Can you imagine watching a series? You know, series are very popular nowadays on Netflix. You watch a series and then he's, they say, okay, at the end, all right, the next episode, you have to wait. Okay, it won't be maybe months or maybe year or years before the, the next episode will come. And so you wait and you wait and you wait. And, and then it comes 400 years later. Would you say, what was you say, what? 400 years, I won't remember the story anymore. You know, sometimes I wait a year, I, I've forgotten what the series is all about. 400 years, 400 years. No wonder it was hard for them, it was hard for Zechariah to recognize that it was truly God he was speaking to him. It was truly from God, the message was from God because historically it's just improbable. It's been so long, it's been too long. God has not spoken to them. And thirdly, it's outrageously inconceivable. Pun intended there, okay? It's outrageously inconceivable. Why do I say that? Well, because think about it. Zechariah was just doing his thing. He was just doing what the priest supposed to do. He was going in, you know, this actually it was a once in a lifetime chance, an opportunity for the priest to enter into the sanctuary to burn the incense. So it was a very special day and he doesn't want to get things wrong. He was being careful to do everything correctly. And then suddenly this angel appeared out of nowhere. Imagine if you were Zechariah, how would you feel? And then not only that, he, he the angel said things that are just so incredulous. Those are, it was just so hard to believe. It's just inconceivable what the angel was saying. If you put yourself in Zechariah's shoes, even I myself, I don't think I, I can believe like that. I'm sure I will also doubt. And that's why I don't think we can blame him when he said, how can this be? You know, I, I'm, we're past the age of childbearing. How can this be? No wonder Zechariah doubted. But if you think about it, in the Bible, many people doubted, right? Even Abraham and Sarah doubted. Moses doubted. Gideon doubted. Thomas doubted. Even Mary later on, a few verses later in the same chapter, even Mary said, how can this be since I'm a virgin? So why was Zechariah reprimanded? Not only that, he was punished. Think about it. Zechariah was punished for his doubts. 
he was not allowed to speak for nine months. Okay. In fact, I think he's more than mute. He was deaf. He, he was, there was silence, the Bible says. He was deaf and mute for nine months. That's like compulsory silent retreat for nine months. That's very hard, especially for a priest. Okay. Just like a preacher. If a preacher or a teacher lose their voice, it's very difficult. Okay. Very difficult. You, you cannot talk. You cannot communicate. And so I believe it was very difficult for Zechariah. Why was his punishment so harsh? Okay, why was he punished for doubting? I believe, okay, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I believe it was because Zechariah, given his spiritual lineage, you know, he was from the priestly line, given his maturity, he's very old, okay, so he's of age, being taking the fact that uh, he has served all these years, his faith should have been matured enough by now. His faith should have been matured by now. So because of that, God was not happy, okay, with his doubt. Because by, by now, he should have been matured. He should have known God. His experiences of God and his life should have matured enough that he would have known that this was from the Lord. He should have known that this, this is truly from God. Well, the important thing for us is this. How about us? When we face doubts, when things happen in our lives, when, when we read the word and, and we begin to have doubts, what do we do? What do we do when doubts come into our hearts and minds? This is very important because, you know, it determines what we do with the doubt. Okay. The problem is not the doubt itself. The problem is what do we do when we have doubts? First of all, we need to admit that you have doubts. You need to admit that you have doubts. Be specific about what they are and ask the Lord for help. Don't be afraid to, to say that you have doubts. Don't cover it up. Don't say, no, I have no doubts. I believe, I believe. No, we need to acknowledge our doubts. We need to say that, okay, I do doubt this. I do have this question. I do struggle with this. We need to acknowledge it so that we can solve it. If you don't want to acknowledge it, then you cannot solve it. You need to acknowledge that you have issues with doubts. Remember in Mark chapter 9, verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. What's that all about? It's when Jesus called him out. Okay, Jesus said, well, what do you mean if I can? Of course I can. Do you believe that I can? And the father said, Lord, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. He was honest enough to acknowledge that there are issues, there are times, there are things that he's doubting. In the same way, we need to admit the struggles that we have. Don't hide it. Number two, use doubts to lead you to the truth. Not away from the truth, but to lead you to the truth. Do not be afraid of doubts, but be careful because doubts can either lead us away from God or doubts can help us, can spur us to seek the truth. So that's what we need to do. Do not allow doubts to say, okay, I doubt and so, nah, this must not be real. Okay, I don't want to believe in God anymore. That's dangerous. Rather, when we doubt, we do doubt, okay, from time to time. When we have doubts, what we need is to use the doubts to help us to seek out the truth. A few months ago, someone sent me this quote over Viber. I, I, I like it. It says, truth does not mind being questioned. A lie, on the other hand, does not like being challenged. Hmm. It's true, isn't it? When we're telling the truth, okay, you can challenge. But when you're telling a lie, don't challenge me, okay? Uh, huh. what, what do you mean? Oh, I'm, I'm, te- I'm not telling the truth. God is truth. God is telling us the truth. And so therefore, God is not afraid of our doubts. God is not scared away by our doubts. His truth will stand. What we need to do is to bring our doubts and, and use our doubts to help us to find the truth, to bring us to Him. Last December, one of our M groups uh, requested me to join them because they have a few questions to ask me. I said, all right, if you have a few questions, okay, it's a, it's a uh, group of uh, young ladies, uh, college age uh, young girls, and they said, can I, can I join them to answer some, a few questions? Well, it turns out it's not a few questions, okay? We, I was there for a full three hour grilling session, answering so many questions. I hope I was able to answer them uh, sufficiently and, and to help them overcome their doubts. But my point is this, I, I really appreciated the fact that they asked. The fact that they acknowledge that we have these doubts about these things 
Can you come and help us? Can you help us? And can you help us find the answers? That's what we need. And, and that's why also why we have M groups and why we need mentors. We need fellow believers around us so that we can struggle together, so that we can go through things like this. You know, in a sermon on Sunday like this, you know, you, you only sit there listening to me. We cannot have a dialogue. But in a small group, we can bring issues up. We can bring things up and we can discuss and we can help one another. So acknowledge your doubts and then use them to bring you to the truth. Use them to come closer to God. Number three, remember your faith is not based on how you feel, but what you know. This is important because often we say, I don't, I don't think this is true because I don't like it. Truth is true, remember, whether you like it or not. So even though we don't like it, know that our faith is not based on our feelings because feelings come and go, they go up and down, they go all over the place. But knowledge of the truth is based on what is true, okay? It's based on what we know rather than what we feel. That's the third point. Fourth, grow in your experience of God. This is the best way to grow our faith. We, When we grow in our experience of God, meaning we come to know Him more and more, our faith becomes stronger because we believe in someone when we know them. Okay, A stranger comes, you won't believe in him, but someone you know, someone you have experienced together with, you believe in him, you trust him. In the same way, our faith in God will grow the more we experience him. And the fifth one, Obey God even when it doesn't make sense now. Obey Him, whether we like it or not. Obey Him, whether things make sense or not now. Often we want to say, when I'm sure, then I'll act. Actually, the opposite is true. When we act, then we can be sure. It's when we obey, when we when we put our foot down, when we step into the water. Remember the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, coming before the raging, uh, raging rushing river. What did God want them to do? God said, when the priest step into the water, then the water will stop. The river will stop. It's not when, okay, if I were the priest, I would say, Lord, stop the water. Then I will step in. God said, no, no, it's when you step in. That's when the water will stop. In the same way, we often say, well, Lord, when I understand your will, then I will obey. It's actually the opposite. When we obey, then we will know. Romans 12 verse 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Notice, when will you understand His will? When will you be able to test and approve? Meaning, you you show that it's true. Okay, You you do an experiment, and, and then the conclusion is, I prove it, I've proven that God's will is true. It's when we obey. When we do not conform, when we are transformed, then we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. And so I hope and pray that we, when we have doubts, when there are times that we doubt, what do we do? We need to acknowledge them. We need to bring use that to bring us closer to God based on, not on our feelings, but what we know. And then we use them to come to experience God more and more. And then we obey God, even when it doesn't make sense. Aren't we glad that the Word of God never changes? We never have a second edition of the Bible. It's been written thousands of years ago. Even today, we still have the same Bible. Unlike all these news articles and and, uh, scientific journals and all these authorities, what they say will change. And we know that, okay? Even things today, they, they keep changing. But God's Word does not change. And because of that, we can believe in the truth. We can believe in what He says. And therefore, even though it's too good to be true, we can believe in him because his word is the truth. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let me pray for you. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. As we begin this study of the Gospel of Luke, we come to this story about Zechariah and how he had to deal with his faith and with his doubts. In the same way, when we come before you, we do believe, Lord, But there are times that we doubt. When doubts come, help us to know what to do and help us to use the doubts to bring us closer to you rather rather than to draw us away from you. And may we grow stronger and stronger in our faith so that we can honor you with our lives, so that we can truly be true followers of Jesus Christ because we wholeheartedly believe in you. May your spirit, may your word continue to speak to us and convict us so that we can truly be your disciples. 
This is our prayer. In Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen.